Hey, everybody, and welcome back to Net DevOps Live. Hank Preston here and joined with Jeremy Stretch, senior engineer and founder of Netbox. We are going to have an excellent discussion today about exactly what Netbox is, um, options for programming it into your network automation and Net DevOps strategies, and all sorts of good kind of behind the scenes information about how folks are using sources of truth and kind of being that effective uh, element in your network automation pieces as it goes in. Now, as with all episodes, if you have questions, feel free to use the question panel inside the webinar. I'll be gathering them up throughout Jeremy's presentation. And then at the end, we'll have about 15, 20 minutes where we'll be able to field those questions to Jeremy and get the best answers out of them in the amount of time that we have left. As always, if you're looking for the resources for today's webinar, you can find them in the links as part of kind of the webinar platform here or over on NetDevOps Live under the webinar resources for today's session. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jeremy to take us away. Thanks, Hank. Um, thanks for having me on the show. It's an honor to be here. I'm really excited to, you know, every opportunity I have to talk to people about Netbox, do a little bit of preaching on sources of truth and, and all that good stuff. Um, so a little bit about me, just a quick background. Uh, I was at DigitalOcean for a number of years, uh, during which time I developed uh, and released Netbox as an open source application. Uh, it's grown beyond my wildest expectations since then. Uh, and for the better part of the last year, I've been at Network to Code, which has been a phenomenal experience for me. Um, we have a great, great team there, and uh, they actually allow me to do uh, development of, network, of Netbox um, more or less full time. So we've got a lot of a lot of really cool stuff to talk about now. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, get set up here. All right, so I'm going to be talking about Netbox as a source of truth today. Uh, first off, you may be wondering if you haven't heard the term before, what is a source of truth? Well, essentially, it's a designated authority over a specific do domain of data. So basically, if you have two conflicting pieces of information, there's two different values for the same piece of data, which one is correct? How do you know which one is correct? Uh, for example, let's say you have two DNS servers that are both resolving uh, the same host name to two different IP addresses. Well, which one is, is right? Which one of them is authoritative for that piece of data? Uh, you may have also heard the, the phrase system of record. Uh, it, it's used somewhat interchangeably with source of truth. It kind of refers more to like the specific um, Inter or uh, source of data, like database for the data itself. It's a little too pedantic, so for, for our purposes here, I'm just going to be referring to everything as a source of truth. Uh, sources of truth can be broken out by function or by domain. So for example, you might have regional sources of truth. Uh, there's no one best way to break these up. It's gonna depend uh, very much on your current and future tool set and organizational politics and just whatever makes sense for you. Um, but the most important key to remember is that by definition, you can never have overlapping sources of truth. There can only ever be one authoritative source for any uh, domain of data. Uh, I will point out that uh, the tool responsible for allocating resources might not be the actual source of truth for that resource type. So for example, if you're getting IP addresses from a DHCP server or, or resolving records from a DNS server, that server may in turn be getting its data, it may be getting populated from uh, a parent source of truth, something that I, where it's actually being administratively defined versus the system that's responsible for operationally allocating those resources. There's two different pro approaches really that I like to think about when we talk about sources of truth. So one is the legacy approach. Uh, this is, you know, up to up until I think a few years ago, no one really had the her, had heard the phrase "source of truth." I'm not exactly sure where it came from, but it, you know, it sounded good, so we started using it. Um, but before that became was that we had a kind of a legacy approach. And if you've been in, in the industry for a number of years, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Uh, this is the an environment where, in which you don't have a source of truth. Uh, you've got basically independent data population workflows for each tool in your tool set. Uh, when you're deploying a new tool or, or, or trying to update an existing tool, typically data is being copied by hand from one tool to another, depending on which sources, you know, most trusted at the time, right? We've all said to ourselves, uh, you know what, we should use, we should go to application X for this because no one, no one updates application Y anymore, you know? Tools get kind of like semi-deprecated depending on, you know, their use. Like, oh, this is still good for like, uh, you know, the Eastern region, but like none of the Western region sites have been added to it and things like that. And there's no orchestration in place to ensure that data is consistent across all tools. So for example, 
there may not be any automated way to ensure that two parallel network monitoring systems are actually using the same IPs and credentials for each device that they're charged with monitoring. Obviously, that leads to a lot of problems. Then we have the SOT approach over here on the right. Uh, this is the, the, the shiny new way of doing things. And the central uh, theme is that new data is only ever input into the source of truth. And all of your tools are pooling from the single central source of truth for whatever domain of, of data that is. Um, there's various ways to do that. Uh, they could be being done through scheduled pools, such as using you know REST API calls or responsive pushes. Maybe the source of truth is actually leveraging webhooks or some other mechanism to uh, reactively push out data uh, resulting from changes to to itself. Uh, and you know the precise method of population is is obviously going to vary depending on you know what APIs and mechanisms are supported both by the sources of the source of truth that you're using as well as the tools that are consuming data from it. Uh, it's also important to note that new data being originated from the source of truth will overwrite any old data where discrepancies exist, right? So again, it goes back to you, the source of truth is the authority for data. And it's something you have to kind of wrap your mind around because a lot of people are still in the mindset that, you know, if my NMS says that device X has an IP address 1.2.3.4, that must be correct or, or was correct at some time. But it's giving, it's kind of, you know, surrendering that authority to your source of truth to say, okay, whatever is defined in the source of truth, even if it doesn't match what's in my NMS, that has to be correct. And just recognizing that. Uh, the real advantage of this approach is that every individual tool can be validated separately against the source of truth at any point in time, right? So if you have three different DNS servers, for example, and one of them is, is and each one of them is different, the correct one is whatever matches the source of truth. So we talked about sources of truth. What is NetBox? Well, NetBox is essentially a source of truth, a general purpose SOT for network infrastructure specifically. You can have a source of truth for anything really, but for net in the uh, context of NetBox, we're talking about network infrastructure specifically. Uh, so things like that include uh, IP address management, data center infrastructure, uh, circuits, uh, data circuits specifically, as well as uh, power feeds and things like that. Anything you might encounter in, in you know day-to-day -day operations of a network. NetBox itself manifests as a web application with robust integration mechanisms, including a REST API, webhooks, uh, custom export templates, even fully custom developed plugins, and uh, numerous other tools that allow you to integrate it with other tools very well. It uses the Django web framework, which is written in Python. So everything's, everything in NetBox is written in Python uh, with the PostgreSQL database and Redis uh, for in-memory data store. And it is an open source and freely available application under the Apache 2.0 license. So it's published on GitHub. Anyone can get it. Uh, it's not an open core model. I know there's there's been a little bit of confusion as far as like when you know how is network to code involved in it. The NetBox itself, uh, NetBox application itself, is 100% open source. There are no commercial components to it. I'll talk briefly a little bit about uh, NetBox history. So it was back in uh, late 2015 where I started developing it uh, as an if, initially as an internal proof of concept at DigitalOcean. Uh, fortunately, Dio was really cool with me releasing it as an open source project back in June 2016, which is, believe it or not, it's almost four years at this point. It's kind of <laughs> kind of uh, crazy how how fast things have been moving. Um, John Anderson was the first person to sign on. Uh, incidentally, uh, neither of us had worked in Network Dakota at that point. He just he was got involved in the project really early, and now John is is uh, my colleague here at NTC. And uh, over the past few years, we've we've grown the team quite a bit, and uh, we're at six currently, I think, with uh, with a few new people joining just earlier this year. And uh, we are targeting two to three major releases per year. So we had we rolled out two to eight earlier this year, two to nine probably sometime in the summer. We might even do 2.10 in December. Who knows? It, it kind of depends on, on uh, just uh, overall uh, development cadence. We'll talk a little bit about the application architecture. So <clears throat> if you're not familiar with the Django framework, Django is basically, it's a Python web framework, but Django applications manifest as the WSGI services behind an HTTP front end. Now, that's probably a little bit different than most tools you're using, you're, you're accustomed to using. The reason for that is, you know, the Django developers realize that there's a lot of really, really robust HTTP frameworks out there like Nginx and Apache that are obviously used globally with, with um, you know, in, in production networks everywhere. And there was really no reason for Django to reproduce HTTP serving capabilities. Uh, so what it does is leverage the WSGI protocol. It's just a, basically just an interface for 
um, an HTTP front end to talk to an arbitrary uh, custom uh, custom application behind that, uh, and and focus all of its efforts there. So basically, uh, the WSGI process is run under Gunicorn, which sits behind Nginx or, or Apache. And you can see the example stack to the side here. Uh, you can use Nginx or Apache. You can use Gun Gunicorn or Micro WSGI. That's um, really you know the different components are up to you. This is just probably our most common stack. And then behind the application on the database layer, we have PostgreSQL for relational database, and we use Redis as a, which is uh, an in-memory key value store for uh, task queuing and for data caching. We'll talk a little bit about the design philosophy. So Netbox was founded with three uh, guiding design tenets. The first is that its data model intends to replicate real world constraints. So simple things like, obviously you can't install a 4U device and three U's of rack space. Uh, IP addresses have to be assigned to specific interfaces rather than like, you know, in the real world, you don't assign IP, uh, you don't assign IP addresses to devices directly, but rather to interfaces which belong to devices and the, and the data model replicates that uh, very, very concisely. Another example is that a physical circuit, you can only have two endpoints. This is a common point of, of confusion, I think, also, because a lot of people say, well, how do I model an MPLS VPN network or an overlay or things like that, where you have, you know, essentially a, a multi-point virtual connection. It's important to understand that what NetBox is doing today is modeling physical circuits where you you have two endpoints. So either, you know, local site and a provider or a local site and a remote site via a provider. Um, on the, on the topic of overlay stuff, just real quickly, that's something that does come up a lot and we'll probably uh, look at modeling it to some degree in the future, but you know, it's one of those many, many things that, that are uh, on, the, on the quasi roadmap for now. Uh, this data model or, or the, this concept of modeling the real world also means that sometimes you can't restrict things. So as an example, a VRF, a virtual routing and forwarding table may or may not be allowed to have duplicate prefixes and IP addresses. There are obviously solid use cases in the real world where sometimes you want to restrict that and sometimes you don't want to restrict that. And Netbox does give you the option of enforcing it either way. The second rule is that Netbox is intended to be populated with authoritative data and not used as a, uh, not populated with live data uh, fed from a network. The reason for that is importing existing configurations into Netbox without human validation or insight provides little value. Effectively, all you're doing is taking a snapshot of your network at this moment in time. It doesn't necessarily mean it's correct. It's just how things are. I'll give you an example. So you populate all of our configured, uh, all configured IP addresses from a device into Netbox. Okay, everything's great. You've got everything in the database, but how do you know they're correct? What if the database, or what if the device rather, was uh, misconfigured with, with an IP address, or an IP address on, is on the wrong interface on the device? All you've done at this point, if you haven't uh, included any validation in your process is replicated that. And now you're actually worse off because whereas before you didn't know what the correct configuration was, now you actually have a source of truth, a supposed source of truth, asserting that, uh, asserting an incorrect configuration. Now this isn't to say that you can't automate the collection of data, but it's very, very important that it, uh, the data gets validated by a human or at least evaluated by rules defined by a human prior to being imported into the database. The third rule is that uh, our development really favors 90% 90 per, 90 solutions that may not fully support all use cases. Uh, we found that you know return on investment diminishes very quickly as complexity in a feature increases and just making a small change, what, what could be thought of as a small change in the data model might actually be way more involved than you might think. Uh, so we really try to hit that 90% mark on most of our features. Even if it means sometimes a little, uh, you know, some niche use cases get left out on the cold, uh, it's just kind of the reality of an open source application uh, with a huge audience and, and few full-time developers. Currently, I'm the only one working on it full-time. So what does Netbox do? We talked about what it is, um, or you know, it's, it's function as a source of truth. Okay, but you know, what's the scope of it functionally? Uh, well, basically, uh, if you take a look at Netbox's data model, anything that, that shows up in there as an object, as a modelable object, is fair game. Uh, conversely, if Netbox doesn't have a model for it, it's probably out of scope, at least for now. It's not to say we won't support it in the future, but if you want to model something and you don't see, a, you know, if you want to, to configure something in Netbox and you don't see a model for it in the database, it's probably out of scope. 
Uh, Netbox uses a rigid data model with very strong relationships among the different objects that it has. So for example, a device is installed within a rack and a rack belongs to a site and a site can be assigned to a region and everything can be filtered by its, relation, by its related models or related fields. Another example is a cable is connected between exactly two interfaces or other device components, each of which belongs to a device. And you can actually click around in the, in the UI and in the API. You can go from site to rack to device to interface to the remote interface to IP address to prefix to VLAN and so on. Uh, and that box provides validation to ensure conformity to its model. It, it provides a lot of sanity checking around that to ensure that you can't do things, again, owing to the first design tenant uh, that, that would invalidate the you know, real world limitations. Uh, some measure of extensibility is afforded through the use of custom fields. Um, Netbox does allow you to go in there and kind of create uh, custom attributes for, for some of its primary models. Um, but it's something that is to be used sparingly. The current implementation of it is not as performant as it might be. Um, it's something that we, we thought about you know, in the future, possibly redoing at some point down the road. Um, but right now, you know, using custom fields is always going to be a, a, it's going to result in a, a trade-off in performance and validation. So that customizability does come with some caveats. Um, mitigating scope creep is another ongoing challenge of maintaining the project. Features have to be meticulously planned so as to avoid painting ourselves into a corner. So we talk about you know extending the scope in the future. We have to think about the order in which it makes sense to do that because some some features inform the development of other features, and we want to make sure that we're not uh, telling users that they have to deal with an excessive uh, number of, of schema migrations and things of that nature because we want to keep the upgrading the upgrade path itself as seamless as possible. So we talked about what Netbox does. What about things that it doesn't do? Uh, the biggest thing is uh, to realize that Netbox doesn't serve resources directly. So it doesn't act as it doesn't speak DHCP, for example, or DNS. It uh, does not it will not respond to records itself. Right? And the reason for that is there are plenty of applications out there that do DHCP and DNS, for example, very well. And there's no reason for Netbox to replicate that. Netbox's uh, ideal or optimal position in the network is as a system which informs those servers and to populate them with the data that they need to then operate efficiently so they can do go do their thing. Uh, Netbox similarly doesn't provide monitoring or and doesn't provide uh, doesn't routinely interact with devices directly. There is a REST API offering uh, that, that acts as a napalm proxy to devices, but that's mostly just uh, provided as a convenience as more for like one-off accessibility. It's not intended to be sitting there and reaching out to all of your devices at a, at a routine interval like a network monitoring system would do. But again, it can be used very effectively to, in, to inform the configuration of a network monitoring system. Some of the topics here have been proposed and uh, have been decided they're out of scope for Netbox for one reason or another. Primarily, it's important to understand that drawing a perimeter around what we want the application to do is necessary for it to thrive. An application that does one thing, you know, we want application, we want Netbox to, to be an application that does some things very well versus many things kind of poorly or mediocrely. One of my favorite uh, sayings in open source is no is temporary, yes is permanent. Meaning if we commit to a feature, we're kind of, we're, we're obligated to support that feature indefinitely. Or if we say no right now, it doesn't mean the answer is still gonna be no a year or two from now. That might be something we can do down the road. Now, figuring out exactly where Netbox would fit in in your tool set is unique to each organization. Uh, most organizations obviously already have tools that might do some subset of what Netbox provides. Um, it's up to you to determine, you know, what would, if you're looking at, if you're evaluating at deploying Netbox, you know, where, where do you replace existing tools versus supplementing them versus, versus even merging uh, data? And of course, it's not mandatory to use every component of Netbox. Right? We talked about all the different things it does, you know, DSIM, uh, I'm sorry, data center infrastructure management, IP address management, things like that. Um, you don't have to use everything in there, obviously. If you already have an IPAM tool, for example, and you just want something to track device installations and cabling, you can absolutely use Netbox for that. Um, just remember, to, as we talked about in Source of Truth, with Sources of Truth, it's important to always maintain strict delineation uh, between data domains. So why should you use Netbox? Uh, my goal of this presentation is not to sell you on Netbox. It's not gonna be the right tool for everyone in the world. Um, that said, it, I do think it's worth your consideration, at least a little bit of experimentation. Um, so some major points, uh, obviously, in, in 
favor of it is, uh, first off, it's open source, right? Let's be real, it's free. There's no license around it. Um, that's, a, that's a major driver for especially small companies. Uh, there's a strong emphasis on, on integrations and the open exchange of data. You never have to worry about any kind of lock-in using an open source tool, obviously. And we go out, I, I think we, we try to go out of our way to ensure that you can integrate with NetBots as seamlessly as possible with other tools using the REST API and webhooks and things like that. We want to actually actively encourage you to use other tools, even where there might exist some, uh, some overlap in functionality with NetBox. We've also got a very, very um, active community and uh, to, to provide support both through uh, our GitHub and Slack and our, our mailing list on Google Groups. And uh, Network to Code also, as of last year, late last year, has begun offering commercial support. So even if you need some, some more uh, established and reliable form of support, Network to Code is here to offer uh, commercial support to, in that regard. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll reiterate that NetBox itself as a product has no commercial component. It is, you get the whole thing, there's no open open core where you're, pay, you're paying for bits and pieces on top of that. Um, but through NTC, we do provide support and uh, custom development as well. And finally, it's extensible, right? You can you can actually write plugins to do whatever you want in NetBox, uh, maybe extend the data model yourself. Uh, that was just added recently in 2.8 earlier this year. Really excited to see how that plays out uh, long-term. So how do you integrate with NetBox with other tools? I talked about some of these, uh, I mentioned these briefly, but we're gonna go through the list here and, and take a harder look at things like the REST API and webhooks um, and go into each of those a little bit more in depth. So first off, we'll start with the REST API. Here's an example using curl, uh, just the simple command line HTTP client to create a post, to send a post request to NetBox to create a, an object. In this case, we're creating a prefix. Uh, and this REST API isn't, so REST API, if you're not familiar with it, is nothing unique to NetBox. There are plenty of tools that, that implement REST API. Um, and essentially what it means is just, uh, it's a, a prescription for uh, the exchange of data in JSON format over HTTP. So it's very simple, it's very human friendly. You can, a human can sit there and look at, you can look at this and say, oh, okay, I see I'm creating a prefix and its status is active and it's an IPv4 prefix. Um, so it's, all, it's very, very open, very flexible. Uh, given the nature of JSON, which is just a, a mechanism for defining uh, data. If you're familiar with Python, uh, JSON object basically looks like a dictionary or a dictionary of dictionaries. Uh, it's very easy to consume and there are plenty of language specific clients available for the for NetBox specifically, um, PyNetBox and GoNetBox obviously for, for uh, Python and Go respectively. Uh, the API in NetBox, the goal is 100% parity with the UI. We're not quite there yet. Um, at some point, probably in NetBox version three, at some point in the future, will be fully API driven, but that's probably a long way away at this point still. Um, you might also notice here that the first header passed to curl specifies a token. Uh, we use uh, tokens defined in NetBox to control uh, permissions. So basically, and what, who, tokens get defined and associated with user accounts, and then using that token on a request grants you whatever permissions are assigned to that user. And here's an example of the browsable interface. Sorry, that probably doesn't look that great. Uh, but you can see here, uh, NetBox uses the Django REST framework for the REST API under the hood. And what, one of the things that, one of the many things that that framework provides is the ability to render a very human friendly interface to the API. And it's pretty cool because if you make a request to an endpoint with curl, it's just gonna feed you raw JSON. But if you're using a browser, uh, DRF will actually look at the, the uh, user agent and the accept types and figure, oh, this is a browser, let me send them something nice. So, oh, you know, you get this nice uh, syntax highlighted form of it instead of just having to deal with raw JSON in the browser. So that's pretty nice. It's also browsable so you can go and click through different endpoints and click through related objects. Uh, next up, I'll talk about webhooks. So if you're not familiar with it, a webhook is basically an outgoing HTTP request generated from NetBox to an external receiver. Uh, sent in response to a NetBox event. So this is separate from, you see on the left side there, the client is making HTTP requests to NetBox. Well, this other uh, HTTP request, the webhook itself, is completely separate from that process. A webhook is generated in response to an event that takes place in NetBox. So for example, let's say a user creates a device and NetBox sends a webhook to a network monitoring system, letting it know that a new device has been created. Now the NMS can decide at that point what to do with that information, if anything. Maybe it already knows about the device or, or maybe it, um, 
you know, depending on the device's status, it may or may not update its own configuration to, to adjust. Uh, webhooks can be classified by object type and action type. So in the admin UI, I can say, I want to create a webhook for only devices or only sites or only IP addresses. Uh, and I, I may want to limit it to only the creation of new objects, updating uh, existing objects, or the deletion of objects or some subset thereof. Everything is done in the admin UI. And uh, one of the more recent uh, additions to this feature is that request headers and bodies can both be templated using Jinja 2. That's really cool because now you can, instead of just having a raw dump of data, you can actually format uh, the data, the payload of the webhook to a, a format that the receiver expects to receive. Um, if you can't do that, if, if the receiver, it, it's obviously pretty limited in what you can do if the receiver needs something more in-depth than what a simple Jinja 2 uh, template might be able to provide. You might need to implement a, a middleware somewhere in the middle to do some translation. But if those work for things like uh, Slack messages are a good example, you can actually format a webhook uh, to generate payload data that is in the format that Slack will understand and automatically inject into a Slack channel. So you can very easily set up, for example, uh, set a, a webhook that says, um, you know, inject a Slack message to a certain channel every time a new IP address is created. Uh, next up, we'll look at the Python shell slash Django ORM. We kind of use these terms interchangeably. The ORM stands for Object Relational Ma Mapper or Mapping, and it's a part of the Django framework on which Netbox is built. So I can't take any credit for this. This is all part of the amazing Django uh, framework. But Netbox does provide a local Python shell um, which is executed through the NB shell management utility command there. It's essentially just a normal Python shell preloaded with some things. So uh, for example, all the models automatically get imported so you don't have to mess with that. And everything, and it drops you directly into the Netbox environment. So it's easier than trying to execute Python by itself and, and then um, get everything set up. It support it's um, it is a supported interface to Netbox. So the one caveat here is obviously use caution. You're working without a net when you're when you're dealing with the ORM directly. Um, much of the normal UI and API validation doesn't exist in the shell. So for example, if I were you know go in there and, and just typo something that would delete all the devices, they're gone. It's not going to be it's not going to give me a second chance to undo that. Um, but in our example here, you can kind of get a feel for how it works. So. Now, uh, first, what I'm doing is I'm retrieving a device up here. Um, I'm going to call it router. I'm getting a device named DC1 Edge 1. Make sure here's the object. And then if I want to check, you know, what device type is it, I can just access the device type attribute. Uh, I can find out how many interfaces are assigned to it using the ORM. And this is all documented through Django and, and to some extent in the net, for the Netbox specific parts are in the Netbox documentation. This is just a very simple example. But like, let's say I wanted to set a serial number on it. I can assign that to the attribute and then just call save on the object and that'll update the database. This isn't, the, or, the uh, Netbox shell isn't ideal for um, ongoing thing like uh, everyday tasks, but it's it's great for if you have one-off things, if you need to, for example, script out the population of a whole lot of data in, um, at a certain point in time. For example, you've uh, you know acquired another company, you have a whole bunch of data you need to do as a sort of a one-off import task, the ORM is great for that. Uh, kind of following onto that is the idea of custom scripts. So we talked about how you can use the interactive shell Custom scripts uh, extend that to make the interactive shell available via the web UI and the REST API. So for example, you can create and delete objects or generate graphs or send emails or ping devices or whatever you wanna do through the use of custom scripts. So these are Python scripts which integrate with Netbox using a lightweight API that's defined in the documentation. But at a high level, basically, you're going to subclass, the, subclass a script class that's provided by Netbox, define input variables if your script needs input, and then define a run method, which tells it, hey, all right, what am I doing? Uh, input variables, if defined on the script, will render as form fields in the web UI, um, or they can be passed as, as uh, JSON fields in the REST API. The scripts execute with full Netbox permissions and in a full Python environment. So anything you can do in Python, you can do in a custom script. Uh, you also have the ability to infer the, the authenticated user uh, to limit access. So for example, you might want to, uh, if a user only has read access, you might only allow them to execute read, read only scripts. Here's an example of what a custom script might look like in the UI. 
Uh, what I've done here in, in this script is define prefix, site name, site or switch count, and switch model as objects, as variables in my script. So I'm prompting the user for that. And then once provided and, and run, uh, my script can then go out and build out a new site with, with the prescribed number and type of switches. Just as an example, obviously you can do whatever you want uh, in your own custom scripts. Additionally, uh, you have the uh, checkbox down here for commit changes. So scripts can be executed in what we call a dry run mode, which basically says, all right, try to do everything I've just done. And then at the end of it, undo everything, roll it all back. Cause I'm not entirely sure it's gonna work out the way I want it to. Maybe I just wanna make sure that, it, that it's going to. And that way, if there are any issues, you're, you're not dealing with um, with having to, to uh, resolve those, those discrepancies one at a time, everything will just kind of go back to the way it was. So if we put all those together, what is a typical what some what are some typical integrations that, that you might do with Netbox? So here we see um, a fairly uh, fairly common, I think, production uh, deployment where we've got Netbox communicating to ServiceNow using webhooks uh, via a lightweight middleware written in Flask. So Flask is uh, similar to Django, but a very, very uh, much more lightweight kind of implementation of a Python uh, framework. But it's great because it can it lets you do very lightweight processing of, of requests and responses. And here we have Flask sitting in as a custom middleware between Netbox and ServiceNow to allow the two, communi the two uh, tools to talk to one another. Down below, we have Ansible pulling configuration data from both Netbox and ServiceNow. So again, in this, so in this implementation, Netbox and ServiceNow are both parallel sources of truth for, uh, net, for Ansible, for generating network device configurations. So it might be pulling, for example, IP addressing information from Netbox and might be pulling inventory data from ServiceNow, putting that together to generate configurations that can then be applied to live network devices. And then on the left here, we have an example like what I mentioned before, where Netbox is sending webhooks directly to Slack to inject messages notifying uh, Slack users of events that have occurred in Netbox. That's about what I'm going to cover for Netbox uh, for today. Um, okay, I have to plug here a little bit. Uh, again, Network to Code offers commercial support for Netbox. So we help with uh, everything from installation and maintenance to custom development of um, custom scripts and uh, API integrations and even full custom plugins. We're available for that. Uh, we also provide customized training and professional services uh, if you're interested in learning more on how to do that on your own. So uh, please, if you are, are interested and want to hear more about what we can do for you, uh, shoot an email over to info at network to code.com and uh, we're happy to to um, see what we can do. Uh, finally, I'll wrap up with some resources. Um, GitHub is where the project is located on, on the Netbox community uh, organization. We've actually got a few projects under there, including uh, the Docker installation, uh, Netbox Docker. Uh, we've got some community repos set up for de like uh, device type definitions, uh, custom scripts, and reports that uh, other people in the community have, have published. So a lot of really cool stuff to go through there. Uh, the documentation, the official documentation is on netbox.readthedocs.io. Uh, it's updated fairly frequently with every release. And uh, if you're looking for help, the two best places to find it are probably the Netbox Slack channel on networktocode.slack.com and the Netbox uh, mailing list at netboxdiscuss at googlegroups.com. And all that conversation is archived as well. So if you do run into an issue, uh, that uh, discussion group archive is probably the best place to go. And with that, I think I'll hand it back off to Hank. Excellent, Jeremy. This was uh, this is a great introduction to kind of review through. Um, I think every time I talk to you or, or, or watch a presentation from you, I pick up on something new about Netbox that I want to go try to try out in our own environment. And today was no different. Um, the dialogue in the question and answer or the question because I can't answer in there, but the the questions that have come in have been great. So I'm hoping we're going to get through most, if not all, of the ones that came in, as well as a bunch that I've got here as well. Um, so let's, we're going to dive right in on these. So the first one I've got, I think, was um, is an interesting one to go through for someone that's getting started or interested with Netbox. What what do you need to install it? Um, what are the what are the common ways to go through? What do you recommend for that? Uh, someone had questions about specifically like CentOS is listed as supported. Is Red Hat supported? Are those the only Linux operating systems? Like, what's the the most common way people deploy and use Netbox? 
Yeah, so it's a good question. <clears throat> One thing to keep in mind, for, first and foremost, is that NetBox is built on the Django framework. So the, the Django uh, project obviously is much, much larger than just NetBox. There are plenty of applications out there that use it. Uh, it's It's been around for, gosh, I think since 2008 was when I started using it, so it's before that. Um, so basically, we, rel we lean quite a bit on Django for uh, underlying support as far as, like, how do you get... Django installed on on a device or, or on a server is the same thing as how do you get NetBox installed minus you know then the NetBox specific bits. Uh, the NetBox documentation itself does provide we we uh, have step by step installation instructions for Ubuntu and CentOS. Uh, so that's on NetBox that read the docs .io, uh, mm -hmm. that'll walk you through it. Uh, so that's the official supported. Um, version of the installation documentation. That's not to say that's mandatory. There are other ways to do it, certainly. That's just what we support. And we, again, it kind of goes back to, you know, we, we don't really have the resources to maintain um, discrete installation steps for every possibility mm -hmm. that's out there. Uh, another very common form is uh, using Docker. So I mentioned there's the NetBox Docker uh, repo on, on the NetBox community org on GitHub. Uh, that's pretty popular. Um, there's, if you go to the wiki, actually, uh, I don't remember offhand, but if you go to the NetBox GitHub wiki, uh, there's a list there of other uh, alternative installations. People have done things from, uh, we have, I think there's an Ansible playbook to set up NetBox. Mm -hmm. uh, someone on the mailing list the other day mentioned using Puppet. Uh, so there's there's plenty of things out there. There's a lot of different ways to install it. Um, no shortage of options, certainly. But it really does kind of boil down to, you know, if you can put Django on, on it, you can mm -hmm. probably put NetBox on it. Yeah, and the one thing I'll go through there, in my own journey with NetBox, I've kind of tried it, several of these. And we do run NetBox as our production kind of source of truth, or, or to your point, a source, a source of truth for a, a good number of the, the technology domains and pieces that are there. Um, in our workflows, we use Docker primarily. Um, I'll run Docker locally on my laptop, but in our production deployments, we actually deploy it on top of Kubernetes. Um, and then use our, um, we have a production Postgres cluster that actually has our database piece. So we've kind of an integrated NetBox that's there. And so to Jeremy's point, there's lots of options um, to go through and fit into that. Um, one came in uh, recently on this one as well, and I actually noticed it when I was, you were going through the slides. And when you talked about the options for programming and working with NetBox, you mentioned the Python shell and the ORM, um, the REST API and these other ones, but you didn't, um, I think you mentioned it, but you didn't kind of go into the whole Pi NetBox SDK. And I'm curious how you factor Pi NetBox into kind of NetBox as the, the product, the supported platform. What are the differences between that and the Python shell that you exampled there? Because most of my personal work has been using Pi NetBox. Right, that's a good point. So uh, first I'll clarify. So Pi NetBox is a separate project from NetBox. It's um... It, it, it's maintained as a, as a separate thing. We call it a community project, although it is hosted. Um, I think it's still hosted at DigitalOcean uh, as of today, but we'll probably move it, bring that into the fold at some point. Um, but so PyNetBox is, an, is a Python specific API client, meaning it consumes the NetBox REST API. Um, it's, it's analogous to another client is Go NetBox, right? Obviously mm -hmm. for the Go language. So those two are, are, are more or less parallel, just different languages and different, just, you know, obviously somewhat different abilities depending on the, the maturity of the plugin and so forth. Whereas the Jinko shell uh, that, I, that I showed there, or the ORM if you prefer, uh, is interacting with the application directly, so natively. So none of that goes through the REST API. Now, the, obviously, the, mm -hmm. the caveat is that you have you need local shell access to, to NetBox to do that, whereas the REST API client can be used from anywhere. So that's the biggest uh, distinction to make. Um, there's pros and cons to using that, right? Obviously, the, the um, Python shell, just by virtue of being local and having direct access, not having to deal with uh, any of the REST serialization and then things like that, is going to be much, much faster. But you also lose things like all the built-in validation. You lose mm -hmm. remote access. You lose um, a lot of the, uh, obviously, the JSON is a, a, being a standard format and serialization of, of models and things like that. So it just it's a much, much lever, uh, lower level. So basically, if you look at it, if you think about it hierarchically, you've got the database level down here, and then you have the Django ORM, and then you have the REST API that's kind of on top of that. So it's really just a matter of a question of how how tightly you want to integrate with the um, with NetBox. I will actually now that I've now that I've set out that example, I have to issue the caveat: we don't support direct access to the database. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, if you want to make recalls from that, you you certainly can. Uh, the reason for that is that the database schema is subject to change at any time. It may change in a point release, 
Uh, we don't guarantee any of that. And obviously, if you're injecting data into the database, we have no way of enforcing much of our business logic that that, that keeps your Dell uh, that um, protects data integrity. So that's why the, we do we do support um, using the Django ORM. Again, with the caveat that it's you know you're working without a net, so you're responsible for <laughs> cleaning up after yourself, making sure you know you're 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 um, sanity checking everything you do. Mm -hmm. So we do offer that in conjunction with the Rust API. Okay, so. To, I want to make sure I, I hit a couple of points. So did I understand you right? To use the ORM, you have to have shell access to the NetBox. So is that, if I'm working off, if I'm not working on the NetBox server, is is the Python shell and the ORM an, a, an option? Is there a way to like load that and access NetBox remotely from like a development workstation or someplace where you're running scripts and tools? You can, uh, so you can always like shell into the box, obviously, but mm -hmm. you know, it, it's Python, right? You're working in native Python there. So there is no, uh, remote API okay. uh, accessibility for that. So you're basically just you have to have an, an some way to an avenue into that Python environment. Gotcha. Okay, and that's that's what I thought you was going through. I just wanted to, to double check. Um, this is an interesting one on Source of Truth that actually just popped in that I think is worth kind of talking through. So the the general gist of it is customers often have things that may kind of qualify as a source of truth or as a, as a location where they store data. Specifically, uh, ServiceNow is a common one that's used for folks. Um, and in your example that you had on integration, you showed how it was providing um, uh, uh, some source of truth alongside NetBox that's there. Um, the person that posted the question said that he's got some customers that kind of refuse to look at um, other tools to come in because they say they already have a source of truth, they already have ServiceNow, um, it has to do everything. Um, I imagine you you run into this occasionally. How do you how do you help um, folks understand that that one particular platform may not be right for every type of data? That bringing in something like NetBox doesn't necessarily negate the need or the value that's that ServiceNow goes through. And then somewhat related, what's your thoughts on kind of the the source of truth sprawl? Right? Is there a point where you could have too many sources of truth? Yeah, absolutely. It's a good question. Um, so when you have, it's kind of what I've alluded to earlier, right, where you have an existing tool set and you're trying to figure out how to expand that, I think it, it really helps to focus on exactly what problem you want to solve mm -hmm. and highlight and identify uh, any you know, limitations in the current tool set or any gaps in the current tool set that prevent you from solving that problem. So everything has to be... Um, you know, goals based. It's not just, oh, I want to bring in NetBox because I heard it's a cool tool. It's I want to bring in NetBox because our current our cool current tool set, excuse me, won't support blank. Right. Mm -hmm. And what is that? And trying to figure out where that works in. And a lot of people may be off put actually by NetBox because they'll see, oh well this is like IPM and DSIM and does all this stuff. I, we already have some of this. We don't need a whole new tool. And again, it goes back to recognizing, okay, you don't have to use everything that's in NetBox. Mm -hmm. In fact, you have mechanisms in place that you can if you don't assign certain permissions to users, they won't even see the option to create IP addresses, for example. Uh, so you can limit the UI and, and the API in that, in that regard. Um, but as far as, you know, figuring out how it fits into your tool set and how, how to make the case for that is, you know, highlighting what it can do for you and how, and focusing on how it can integrate with existing tools, right? Saying, okay, well, so we can actually have, you know, Ansible, for example, can pull from, can pull, uh, certain pieces of data from NetBox and it can pull certain pieces from ServiceNow, it can pull certain pieces from BlueCat or, or you know, whatever other um, systems might, might also be in your tool set today. And it's really just a matter of kind of figuring out where it fits in and it helps, honestly, it helps to whiteboard everything out and just kind of draw and, and, and start, you know, tagging things. Okay, like DNS comes from here and <laughs> trying to figure that out. And uh, obviously, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to belittle it. It's obviously a huge endeavor. You know, I mean, network to code, we go into customers and we, we spend months with them figuring this out. So mm -hmm. um, it's a lot to think about. But yeah, I think it really boils down to figuring out uh, what this, what specific problems are you trying to solve and how best can you model the data that you need to provide to your tools to operate your network? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, you're, it's one of those pieces that I, I always find myself mentioning is, is talking about something like source of truth or building an automation plan or, or modeling things out for config management or validation is very easy to say, but it's when you actually yeah. try to implement it and work it into existing business processes and things, that's where the work comes in. It's it's very rarely a technical problem. It's a it's a culture, yeah. it's a tooling, it's a decisions issue. Yeah, um, there have been a lot of situations where I've said, please, please just give me a technical problem. Just let me figure out how to make two APIs talk to one another. <laughs> yeah, that's so true that goes in. 
Um, here's one that came through, and I, and I don't even, I found myself tackling this in, in cases as well. You mentioned custom fields, I think, in the presentation. I don't know if you specifically called out tags, but th that's an area where I, I look at those as mechanisms to kind of customize NetBox to our own use cases. And, and we've used a bit of both in our own environment. Um, but they also have this huge potential for sprawl and technical debt as they kind of get out of control with, with tags and custom fields. So how do you how do you determine or how do you recommend folks kind of picture or, or pick when to use a custom field, when to use a tag? Is there Are there good use cases for both um, caveats or things that you would suggest people think about before kind of jumping down um, either path? Sure, that's a good point. I think the, the primary thing to recognize is that tags are, um, so for anyone not familiar with the, with the product, tags are basically just little slug values uh, that can be assigned to, to many different objects in that box. So you might have a, a tag for under maintenance, for example, mm -hmm. and you might just throw that onto devices or specific uh, you know, IP addresses or whatever in that box, any, any object that supports tags. Custom fields are intended to actually communicate a value. So a, a tag is basically just a single, uh, a single identifier uh, that means the same thing to whatever it's applied to. Whereas a custom field is some other additional attribute that doesn't exist within the native data model that you want to communicate and associate with resources in NetBox. So an example of a custom field might be, okay, I need to tag a site with a geolocation field, right? Something that doesn't exist in NetBox. We have GPS coordinates, but maybe you have a specific thing that you need to tag it with. Maybe it's a low code, you know, a UN low code or something like that. So you would create a custom field for the site model in NetBox. Uh, it may or may not be mandatory. And then that, uh, obviously would have a unique value for each site, which is assigned. Whereas a tag is just kind of, we would be more of like, um, more of Boolean in nature, right? It either has the tag assigned or it does not. Mm -hmm. Some people kind of take tags a little bit further than that and they'll they'll try to assign key value pairs using tags. I won't take a, a standpoint, a stance as to whether that's correct or not. Obviously whatever, whatever works for you is what works for you and I'm not, I'm not you know, having no knowledge of, of your specific use case, I'm not qualified to say whether or not it's correct. Um, I'm just, I can only speak to what the tool was intended to do and what, the, what they were intended to be used for. It doesn't mean that's all they can be used for, but it's important to keep in mind that that's going to be the development focus moving forward is always going to be for the intended use case. Mm -hmm. yep. And on the, on the note of, uh, sorry, just uh, real quick on the, on the topic of custom fields, a lot of people have been asking, oh, can we get custom fields on interfaces? Can we get more types of custom fields? Like at some point we'll probably do that. Right now, because the way custom fields are implemented, um, they're, right now custom fields all exist as one really big table, which if you know anything about database design, uh, having one really big table for everything is probably not the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're looking at, you know, is there, are there ways we can break that up, make them more performant, um, optimize, you know, what we can do with that. Uh, like, can we start indexing values and things like that before we grow that any further? Right, it goes back to kind of how some features inform the development of other features and just wanting to keep everything uh, keep the, the upgrade path as seamless as possible for users. No, oh, and that's good. And, and I think that one of the things I've enjoyed kind of listening to you and, and reading through issues and some of the stuff in the Slack channel is the thought that kind of goes into um, decisions that are made, which isn't always the case with some projects that are there. Some folks are like, oh yeah, any question or request, yeah, let's go solve it. We'll, we'll dive in because anything can be done with code. Um, but there's there's tech debt, there's there's um, yeah. problems that, that come through. Um, I wasn't gonna ask this one just yet, but th it's a good point based on that dialogue. Um, technical debt comes with any system and, and NetBox has been up, you said almost four years now. Is there anything you look back on the early days of development or decisions you made early on that you kind of, I don't wanna say regret, but wish you would have made a, done differently or you find yourself continually kind of stuck because of some decisions? And I'm not asking because I want you to like poke fun or problems at this, but just to let the entire audience know that we all make these problems, right? Everybody, even giant successful projects get stuck with stuff that we made. We made decisions early that we didn't expect the uh, the results from. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, some topics immediately pop to mind. I, I will say that I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy that we don't, uh, for a project that's, uh, of our age, we actually don't carry that much technical debt. I think we do, I and the other maintainers, we do a pretty good job of keeping it down. And a lot of that is just being more conservative as to what will we'll, mm -hmm. we'll entertain its feature requests. But there are a few things, certainly. Custom fields is one of them. Like I said, we have one big table. Um, you know, if people are looking at using this more and more and more. Obviously, that's something we probably have to take a harder look at and, op and see how we can optimize that. Uh, another thing is, is like our testing framework, right? So 
when NetBox first came out, I didn't have tests. I didn't, I didn't know what tests were. <laughs> you know, I kind of <laughs> kind of learning a lot of this as I go. But um, so now we have we have a pretty good test framework set up for like UI views, but we don't have it for the API views. Uh, we have a lot of individual tests. There's a lot of um, rote logic and redundancy and stuff in there, and yet some things aren't covered consistently. So a lot of that is, you know, tests are always, you know, I think probably second to documentation. <laughs> documentation is always the last to get updated. Tests are the second to last. Um, but you know that's that's another point where we kind of have to go back and realize now you you almost have to build it before you know what to test, and now it's kind of just a matter of going back and and going through thousands and thousands of lines of, of redundant code and and trying to optimize and make that more efficient. And uh, I'll give you another so another example. It's no longer tech debt, but was for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, as of two point seven, we changed um, a lot of the the choice fields in Netbox, so things like site status uh, were mapped to numeric IDs in the database, and we realized using the API. You know, this isn't very helpful for users. You know, no one cares that an interface type is 1600. That doesn't mean anything. I want to know that it's gigabit Ethernet or, or 10 gig Ethernet. You know, the numbers don't mean anything. So we actually replace those with all human human friendly values, which is a little bit easier now for for both humans and for um, people who develop API clients because mm -hmm. uh, they no longer have to maintain these rope mappings of of IDs. So like that's one example of things where we realize, hey, you know, let's go back and, and change this. And fortunately, I have to give a shout out to Django here again. Django is an awesome framework. It allows us to do all these these complex database schema migrations by just writing migrations. And for the most part, aside from a few folks who have had issues, you can just apply an upgrade and it takes care of everything automatically for you. It's automatically um, updating the data so there's no manual intervention to do th things like that, even very large changes. Awesome. No, that's, that's good feedback. I think we've, I'm hoping I've got time for the, my last two questions. Um, there's a ton more on my sheet here. There continues to be questions coming through. So what I will let everybody know, I'm gonna try to gather all the questions that have come in and then work with Jeremy to kind of put short answers together um, for folks and get those posted as part of the webinar resources for the episode. So if your question wasn't answered live, um, I do see them, we have captured them. We'll see if we can get those answers out. Um, or hit me on Slack, I'm on there as well. Yeah, that's true too. So the two that I wanted to hit, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on populating NetBox or any source of truth to get going. In your presentation, you talked about how NetBox is intended to drive configurations and validation and testing, but not be like fed data in. Um, but we have to get the data there at some point as it goes in. And so it's, it's my view has always been, okay, if you have an existing network and lack a source of truth completely, that you have to kind of figure out where to read data from the current source of truth, which is the real network. And so it's one of those cases, you may not like the current source of truth, or it may not even be fully what you want it to be configured as, but my view has always been, okay, if that's all you have, then maybe the initial population and you, you feed in from, from a network. The validation that you mentioned is really important. Um, so I guess the the, the piece and the, the feedback I'm looking at for you is how do you tell folks when you go into a customer and say, okay, let's let's populate the source of truth, let's get started. Like, how do you tackle a fact where the only source of truth really is the current running network? Yeah, I mean, I mean, typically most people are going to have at least spreadsheets. That's what we see. You know, 99% of people probably still have spreadsheets or something. That's a that's a good place to start because spreadsheets are very easy for humans to read through and identify this is incorrect. You know, you can even if it's just an Excel sheet that has um, some highlighting based on cell values, you know, that's a start. That's that's validation, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> if you can do that. Um, so that's some form of validation. So I don't mean you have to go out there and write and have a whole test suite for your data, right? It's just some kind of validation to, to sanity check things. And listen, there's always going to be errors, right? It doesn't matter how much validation you have on any of a net, on a networks of any reasonable complexity, there's going to be to be uh, errors. We tend to simplify things, but the reality is these are extremely complex systems. Um, but as far as like getting the, you know, taking that first step, uh, there's plenty of different ways to do it. Spreadsheets, is, I think, is probably going to be the most common and the most accessible for most users because mm -hmm. everyone knows how to use a spreadsheet. Export, export that to CSV. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe fiddle around with column names and column orders. Export that to CSV, and then Netbox will actually allow you to import CSV data directly. Uh, might take some trial and error uh, to get all the all the related objects identified and things like that. But that's a great way to go. Um, but it's just a matter of you know having having someone look at it and like does the, does all this make sense? And then you can obviously do uh, you can automate validation for things like that. You can write even just little simple Python scripts that might load a CSV and say, okay, make sure site is always one of these values, or make sure you know I, an IP address is always within this range, or something like that. And just making sure that everything kind of kind of um, exists as, as it should. Make sure that you know. Gigabit ETH 000 is always connected to router A, you know, for example. You know, we, that's what we try to do is we try to uh, obviously templatize things as best as best we can. It's not always a possibility, but we try to leverage that and the ability to, to 
um, apply validation at, at scale like that. Um, beyond that, you know, there's there's obviously importing stuff from device configurations. There's plenty of tools out there that would be a whole series <laughs> whole series of talks. Um, there's the REST API. You can use things like um, you know, maybe you're using Pi Netbox to pull data from from Ansible and, and loading that in. And if you know, if, if it's already been validated, it doesn't really matter where it comes from. It's just a matter of ensuring that you have some human in there looking at um, at data. And that and that's not to say that everything has to be validated before import. There's there's tools available as well. I didn't really cover them, but there's something very similar to custom scripts. Uh, we allow you to write custom reports that will mm -hmm. actually go through and validate data in Netbox. And so once you have everything loaded, you can say, okay, make sure. All of my sites in 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 the U.S. have a time zone set, you know, something like that. You can do that, and it's, it'll it, you can have it run. You can even schedule a cron task to have those run at a, every night or so, and then in the morning you'll see, oh, these three objects failed validation on that, and you go in there and fix that. So, awesome. All right, and the last question I'm going to ask is: Let's say I've got somebody that's that's out there, they've used Netbox, and they want to kind of contribute back, get involved in the project. What are your recommendations for somebody that wants to do that? Are there are there good places to start contributing? Are there areas to help? Are there are there spots that you could use help? You said you're the only full time developer. Clearly, we want to give you some help um, and make sure that the product continues to uh, to go well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first thing I, th I think is is join the Slack channel. Um, that's probably the best place to get the most live asynchronous, you know, feel for for the project flow. Um, and to express interest, uh, obviously register on GitHub if you're not already. Take a look around the project, familiarize yourself with the code base, get some idea of, of that. And I would say even look through, start by looking through the, the release notes, right? Go mm -hmm. through, okay, what kind of stuff have we been working on? What's on, take a look at the milestones that we've mapped for 2.9 and 2.10 currently, right? Okay, well, what are we working toward? And then obviously we always, uh, bugs are always a given, right? If there's anything out there that's a bug, take a look at it. Uh, the biggest thing that, that, that we kind of want to avoid with people is a lot of people get a little too eager with things and they'll say, okay, oh, this is a cool feature. I want to do it in Netbox. They go out and they 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 implement it and then we just get a pull request. And it's just for like some feature they want to put in Netbox and we're like, sorry, we can't do this. Everything has to have an issue open first so we can discuss it and everything. Mm -hmm. And then people get annoyed with us like, well, I just spent so much time on it. Why aren't you going to do it? It's like, why didn't you talk to anyone first? You know, <laughs> let's do that first. Make sure that someone else knows you're working on it. Um, you know, I'll do it. If you, if you express interest in, in an, even an open feature request or a bug, um, you know, comment on it and I or one of the other maintainers can go through and assign you to it. And then they, that's, that's your baby, you know, mm -hmm. go, go for it. If you, if you, I obviously start small, don't go out there and try to implement object oriented permissions on your own. Cause I struggle with that. Um, but there's, there's lots of little stuff in there, little features. And we've had some people come in, you know, they're just, um, we'll blow through some features and knock them out for us. And that's great. And that really helps get the, uh, get the open issue count down. Um, but the biggest thing is just let someone know that you're interested in working on it. And then if you run into issues with it too, like, Everyone else is here. Feel free to, to comment. Um, you know, if you just want to bounce an idea of how you might be able to, to implement something, or if you ran into a wall, comment either on GitHub. Uh, we, I, I will say, we we prefer to keep all of the development oriented discussion on GitHub just so that there's a record for it. Obviously, in Slack, you say something and it's gone the next day. Um, so all development focused stuff gets there. But if you're just not sure of how to do something like in Python or in Netbox generally, the Slack is a great place for that. The Google group um, discussion list is a great great place for that as well. Awesome. All right. Well, I think the, the key to that is is talk to the community. Become part of the Netbox community if you want to get involved um, on those pieces. All right. We are at the top of the hour. We will do our best to kind of uh, work through the, the outstanding list of questions that we didn't get through. But any final thoughts for our audience before I close this down, Drew? Uh, no, I'm just saying uh, our next release should be Netbox 2.9. We're hoping to shoot for June or July, depending on what happens. And we're, we're, uh, we're at a point now, I'm really, really happy because we're finally getting back to some of those kind of mothballed issues, like really long-standing feature requests. I've been working on something right now, number 554. Whenever you get a three-digit uh, issue number, you know it's been around for a while. <laughs> uh, but like that's uh, object-oriented permissions, and we just have a lot of cool stuff coming. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of of gathering development resources and trying to put every get all our ducks in a row as far as when what to do when. And but uh, yeah, lots of lots of cool stuff coming. Uh, lots of lots of great integrations continuing to happen. So I'm really really happy with that and excited about about where the project's going. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you again for joining me. It's been a great presentation and discussion. And uh, I will talk to you soon. Thanks. All right, everybody. So finishing up on this wonderful ep episode of Net DevOps Live. Now, as always, if you're looking for the, I'm trying to get the slide.
There it goes. If you're looking for the webinar resources for today's episode, you can find the documentation, the links, the slide downloads, uh, some definite sandboxes you can use for some of your pieces and code samples. All of those are available under the webinar resources for today's episode as it goes through. And as always, I like to provide code exchange challenges to give people an idea of something to test out and try with your own uh, kind of knowledge that we've gained today. So go use Netbox as a source of truth in one of your automation projects. Uh, maybe it's use it to drive some configuration or maybe verify configuration matches the source of truth. Pick which one kind of fits your use cases the best. And as an example, maybe go check and see if the interface descriptions on your switches actually match the interface descriptions in Netbox. I know keeping those descriptions in sync is a great way to make sure everybody knows what's going on. And that's a good use case for kind of seeing how the source of truth can drive it. Now, if you're looking for more information on NetDevOps, please check out the NetDevOps homepage on uh, uh, DevNet itself, as well as NetDevOps slash live for all of the information about previous episodes of our seasons and episodes of NetDevOps live. And then our blogs and video courses, there's no, um, no limitation in the amount of detail and, and kind of the, the hole you can dig yourself in on this great NetDevOps information that's out there. Now we do have one more episode left in season three. Next week, George Kobar with Elastic will be joining me to talk a bit about kind of logging and analytics and gathering information across our network and using them in a, in a modern framework like the Elastic Stack. Um, we've been working really hard the last several weeks on the demonstrations and the presentation. It's gonna be an excellent one. If you haven't yet, please be sure to register for that to catch us live or the recording. And then as always, if you have more questions, please feel free to reach out. You can find me at hapresto at cisco.com on Teams, WebEx Teams, or via email, hfpreston on Twitter, and be sure to follow Cisco DevNet on all the social medias. And once again, thank you so much for joining us today for this episode of NetDevOps Live. We will see you next week. Take care.